Is it recording? Yeah, so <clears throat> you're right. Um, you're, you're in a predicament because you are a government organization ex post facto owned by a private not for profit healthcare entity, right? Right. I mean, you're a county, county government, but you are the whipping child of that health system because, let's face it, they, they're the largest employer in the county. They, 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 they run outside of the like power board. They run that county, essentially. I mean, they <coughs> to, to some extent. They run y'all's operations. Your medical director is their medical director. You know, they're. The, the, I was saying this, and you, you can. I know. Chief Mills will not say it. Uh, Puckett will not say it. Nobody will say it. But they're going to put a they're going to put at least one, maybe two bucket trucks at Murphy Medical Center. And you know what? That that cuts both ways. That's going to be good. That's going to be good and bad. That's going to be good for you, as Jimmy is not going to be taking so many rides to uh, Chattanooga. But it's going to be bad because it's going to cut a million dollars of income from Cherokee County. Maybe not a million. They don't put two. I'm not there all the time. It's going to cut a lot of income. It's going to cut. You're damn well close to riding them at me. I mean, but the, the county got, has gotten used to income. And, and Chief Mills keeps stating if they do it, he's cutting out the five truck. And I said, you're lying. You can't cut our services in the county. Oh, they can if they don't need it. Can but it's really 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 hard. I mean, go 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 to go to Washington downtown chapter now. Hey, we're pulling this man unit because you don't use it. We're not gonna pull that truck. No, well, they will still you'll still have a truck down there. No, 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 no I'm just saying. But yeah, I I know what you mean. You, but tell me you're pulled the fifth truck and you're like, man, whatever. You know, it all depends on the politics of the region, right? So, um, I apologize today is going to be um, enthralling and entertaining. Um, I, I will try to make it as entertaining as I can. It is uh, medical, legal, ethical, background, history. Uh, I try to throw some cool history stuff in here because I like history. I'll get to that in the next hour. Uh, but I'm going to not go as long as I did yesterday because you all will be laying here with your heads on the table asleep if I go an hour and a half at a time. So I'm going to try to stick to like 35, 40 minutes. Let's take a break at the most. If I get to like 40 minutes, somebody will be like, hey, we need to get up and get coffee. Or if you fall asleep, I'll stop. But, you know, just being straight honest. Uh, I am, I'll introduce myself again, though, even though everyone was here yesterday. Uh, my name's Matt. I will be here with you until Tuesday. Uh, I have a diverse background, and I'm not going to get into that because you all, all were here. Jimmy knows me very well, so let's not even talk about that background. <laughs> uh, so this is the intro portion of the University of Iowa's um, critical care, specialty care transport uh, series, and uh, it, it, it is not the most enthralling stuff, so I do apologize, but, you know, there are things that have to be done, right? Um, the focus statement, and if I move around, I apologize, I can't sit still. Uh, so it's literally a few of us in here, so let's, we'll make it fun. But uh, in this module, we're going to introduce the history of critical care medicine, so the roles and function of a critical care uh, transport team, and the basic differences between pre-hospital and critical care transport. This is the uh, lecture series of the one the section one of the University of Iowa's um, EMS critical care curriculum and criteria. So some basic terminology, um, CCEMTP is the, the cognitive intelligence, uh, critical 
set a critical care emergency medical transport program, said this is not a UMBC critical care EMT paramedic. Glenn does a lot better job of explaining this in a little bit yesterday of how this whole thing came about. Um, you know, the history of what programs. I'm, I'll, all I will give you is the short version of that is the University of Iowa program was created, UMBC thought, hey, this is a good idea. We could um, get a lot of FTE mixed money and create their own program. And they're a lot better advertising it. Let's just put it that way. But in other parts of the country, the university, UMBC patch is looked at like that. But again, you have to look at where you're at geographically. Um, the folks that designed this program wrote the textbook of that we're using. The objectives are streamlined with what the program is on. So uh, I have been through both programs. The UMBC program, I will say, I followed or had trouble following because what's on the text and on the lecture and on the test is not altogether. I think, the, I think the major thing that I had problems with with the UMBC program was that it's content, it's condensed nature. <laughs> that was standing before the fire heralds of knowledge. It was, and I had taken a critical care. This is my third iteration of critical care. You, like the, you, the, you said the contentious nature. The, no, the 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 condensed. Oh, the condensed nature. I got you. <laughs> it was, you know, ninety five. Monday through Friday for a week, and that was that was your program. And it was you sat there like, okay, and I've been through this already once, and it was just it is um, you know, crash. Yes, yes. Like and there's a time and place for that, but yeah, but we, we don't even do that with our specialty care transport. And that's what when he said he was going to do this, I hopped at it because I'm like, no, I don't want to ever do that again. I love CICP. That was brilliant. It was, you know, once a week, maybe or twice a month over a couple of months. And that was the best because it gave you time to kind of imbibe. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I get that completely. Yeah. Um, UNBC is a lot of material, and it's a huge. It, it is a. It, it's a. Yeah. I'm. I'm being recorded, and I'm probably not going to go much more than that. Standing in front of the fireplace of knowledge. Specialty care transport (SCT), uh, aka also critical care transport. We'll talk about the definition of SCT versus ALS to ALS-1 kind of a little bit uh, when I talk about uh, reimbursement issues. Um, Inter-facility transport, most of y'all probably do inter-facility transports. Um, I know some folks, that's all you do. But. So various models of, uh, within the critical care uh, programs. So you have standard EMS for the critical care role if needed. Dedicated critical care ground transport, rotor wing transport, fixed wing transports. Uh, what I mean, dedicated, you know, standard EMS, talking 911, and you also take um, critical care transport patients. This is probably least common among like county services. You absolutely, I'm sure, take critical care patients and are probably not in the we phrase that probably not uh, always embodied with the support that you need to be taking those critical care patients. Um, I'll give you our example. Our private service we have uh, three 911 contracts. Our 911 contracts have critical care roles in them. There are two critical care paramedic or specialty care paramedics on each shift at each 911 service. So that only those providers can take critical care patients. They're, they're the only ones that can take um, VIP patients and take patients on certain things. Um, so that's everybody does transports, but if it's an SCT patient, absolutely. Um, that, and if, if we're not above, if it's a pediatric critical care patient, call it a pediatric critical care truck. 
I, I, there is no, um, there's, there's no fault in looking out for the best interest of the patient. If the crew that is there, um, and I'm not saying nobody's capable of, um, is not competent in transporting a pediatric patient, and this is getting me medical, legal, ethical a little bit ahead of time, but um, there's no sub, you know, it's apples and oranges when you have, when there's a critical care paramedic, they don't have as much experience with pediatrics, that's not their wheelhouse, and then you have a NICU truck that has a, you know, a pediatric critical care transport team you know, with the yes, quality. with a with, yeah. with a yeah. you know critical care R, a pediatric critical care RN, and, if you get, you know, and some, sometimes the pediatric respiratory therapist. That's a big difference, you know. That that's uh, equipped to you know the equipment to transport the the patient. So well, it would be the same place of putting taking a thirty five year old man, putting him in that uh, pediatric NICU transport. Right, and that's that crazy. That crazy. Right. I've been treated an adult ten years. Right, so, you know, that, that's it's the same. It's the same deal. You know, that's like saying um, this patient's. I'm going to pick on a smaller hospital that has an IC that has like an eight bed ICU, and I'm not going to name anybody. But that's like saying this patient's got a having a huge MI, and they're on eleven drips. We can't get them out right now. We're going to go up to the ICU, and you're going to fend for it. They can. They do have the knowledge and skills to do it, right? But do they do it often? Probably not. So, same concept. You gotta, um, you gotta think about what's what the comfort level and the comfort level of the provider. If you're not comfortable, then you know, yeah, we don't to, do it. Have the, the example of uh, one of my calls. Like I said, years ago, I got off the truck in 2014. So, long, 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 long time ago. Uh, where we got called to um, sensory. Woman was history of crack cocaine. This was her fifth pregnancy. I think she was five or six centimeters dilated. Uh, we got called to, you know, transport us, you know, and I said to the guys, it's okay. This is not the best way because, you know, again, we're don't drop because we, we have the you know, equipment, we have the abilities, it, you know, but you, because you were supposed to go to the NICU and in, in, uh, WayMed, and I said, okay, might want to call WayMed's kids team. Yeah. They have an isolate. I said, because I said, this woman's going to deliver, the baby's going to be the size of my hand. Not that we do not have the ability to deliver and route, but your best choice would be. <laughs> These people will have the equipment, the experience, the isolate, the you know, the you know, stuff like that. I said, yes, we are, you know, good and fair capable, but we are not a beast. And you say, you know, the the um, the, the respiratory therapist. <laughs> well, that's a good, that's a huge animal right there because yeah. um, I give you an example. I have um, I go to almost got fired over this actually. Um, so. You call up to a uh, community hospital and the patient to transport a 11 day old. Okay, that's not really okay. Cool. Yeah, that's not, it's not a new thing. My own patient's for three days. You know, it's, it's cool. 11 days old. It's like, okay, well, what's going on? The patient's airway is swelling and we don't know why. It's like, okay, are we? Can we have it? We don't want to do that. We don't know what's going on. So the airway swelled, right? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, All right. You're concerned what's going on, I'm like, and uh, all right. So let me throw this at you. And I take this patient to where? Oh, I'm just throw this out there. This is Murphy, um, and Murphy is a band aid station. We want to take this patient two hours to Mission Hospital in Asheville, which is not a children's hospital. It just has a peds floor, a peds ICU. Let's see what's going on. I'm like, okay, well, we bounce this kid down the road for two hours. Can I take it to Chattanooga? There's a huge storm front on the way. I want to fly. I was going to be my first thought. Is so I want to fly. fly. I said, let me, fly, let me fly the kid. I was like, well, you know, we can't go. You know, this ordeal is 
basically, you can't, we can't fly to the east because of the weather. So I can get a helicopter here in 10 minutes, I can fly to Chattanooga, and it's a 17 minute flight. And it's level, it's a level one pediatric children's drop center. So don't know what's going on, I prefer to go there. All right, all right, cool. Now, we've already got acceptance, so I don't give a shit. I can't, I don't, I don't care that you've got acceptance. I'm looking at what's best for the patient. You want to go to the closest, most appropriate facility. Um, and they go, so, all right, well, next, next step. So, okay, if you're concerned about the airway swelling, you don't want to make this patient. Then we call a feed, you know, an EQ truck to come get the patient. No. Um, ultimately, it's up into a, a screaming match with the physician. And I say screaming match. I'm getting screamed at by the physician. Oh, yeah. Um, because I'm questioning okay. their authority. <laughs> and, well, I had this stuffy charge nurse. I don't even remember who the hell it was. Well, are you not qualified to transport a pediatric patient? I'm, I'm, it's not a matter of, and then she said, well, are you PAL certified? I'm like, lady, I taught every one of your ER nurses PALs. Yeah, I'll serve. Pick up the pick up the on the monitor. So yeah, I got you. Let's let's back this down just a second, because we're coming from a medical floor where they admitted this kid to it. They're trying to like they're freaking out because yeah. we admitted this eleven day old with some airway swelling, and they're so they're freaking out a little bit. And not all their nurses are pal certified, so that's why I like they got all this puppy. And I'm like, okay, yeah, so. so um, so I'm trying to actually get the NICU truck regardless of what she says, and the shift supervisor calls me, uh, Jimmy's direct supervisor, <laughs> and uh, basically I'm taking this patient regardless. Okay, so I'm, you're telling me like I'm going to the house, so I don't take the patient. Okay. All right, so made some deals, we got uh, respiratory therapists go with us, and uh, talking to the respiratory therapist going down the road, they, they hosed me. So okay, well, you know, tell me your experience with innovating infants. Should have asked more questions about that. How yeah. how does me as a respiratory therapist, Michael? Shit, you didn't do any good. Um, lo and behold, we bounced that kid two hours down the road to Asheville. Kid had a skull fracture. So that gut instinct when you think of what you should do for your patient, the child would have been better served being put on a. 17 minute helicopter flight to a trauma center yes. instead of being bounced down a road for two hours with a skull fracture. Uh, but you call, we, we call, that's how. So, well. so that, that's why I say you're, you're in this this dynamic. You've got to be be careful because you have politics to play into it. Um, so I just, I, I kind of way off track here a little bit, so I apologize, but I understand, you know, it, it's. Use the resources that are best available. So and when we came out, when I came out here, when I came back out east, I had a lot more support for that. When I said, I "said this patient's not stable to go with this crew." Period. I was like, "I want." I was like, "You know, the patient needs." I know we're only we're only forty minutes from the destination as a helicopter or. We don't do nearly as much helicopter transports here because we're so well, it's the population, uh, the popula you know, the population and the, the proximity um, to the specialty centers. But um, I have no arguments to the point of we developed a program and we have a critical at our hospital, we have a critical care transport service uh, that's a dedicated CCT service. Next to that critical care transport service, there's four bays here. Yeah. First health, and then in that next bay over, UNC critical care transport. We have a partnership with yeah, them. Yeah, the two most people that serve us are in the UNC area. Because we, oh, take, my we take a lot of patients to UNC. Yeah. A lot. And that's pretty much where we go back and forth so when I was here. Why not? I mean, it was like, why not? Y'all are losing money bringing them in. Like, I mean, we're serving the population, is what we're doing. That's it. And they're paying us rent. All right, so we're not really losing that much money. We're losing transports. We dispatch them, and they have a peds crew there. So if I need a peds, if I, you know, if I have a critical peds, I don't have to wait for a truck to come from UNC most of the time. Sometimes it's not a peds crew, but I 
right away for a peach truck to come. And then I'll have to put a crew that would not be comfortable with that 11 nail okay. skull fracture. That's why I ended up saying to the doc, you know, hey, listen, you know, yes, we can do this. You know, we'll get another crew, we'll go do a crew, and, and we'll deliver them out, we'll get there, and your baby will be delivered. But, but this is not your best tool. Yes, it's not best. So get, get on the phone to the obstetrician on the receiving hospital, you know, work it out, come back, tell me your decision, and I will, you know, accept <coughs> it regardless. And he came back to me, you know, very humble and says, you know, you got a point. Okay. Well, long story <laughs> short, my argument was... And then I can unclench my butt. Because <laughs> I was standing on hold. Oh, my God. But the, the physician throws, well, I'm not... A couple of things. I'm not really familiar with what my services around here are. Like, well, maybe you should ask. Maybe like, you should ask. So you should ask. <laughs> That's like two. It's like, well, she's a Medicaid patient. Like, nobody gives up. Nobody cares. I was like, I get it. Okay, Medicaid doesn't like to pay out of state. No. I get it. They don't like to, but they will. They will. I was like, in that instance, they will. Because, again, we transported the patient 124 miles instead of 64 miles. Yeah. That would wound up getting transported again, I guarantee you, to somewhere else. I was going to say, they, 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 they got, yeah, to trauma center. got transported to, to a pediatric trauma center nice. in Charlotte. Yeah. So now we're talking five hours away as or as opposed to so. And it goes, your, it goes your boat now. So I'm, I'm almost fine. You know, I'm almost sitting the house that night over, which I, I'm amazed that he had the colonies to tell me that. Um, yeah, me too. I think he had backing up that night. But uh, before I got back, medical directors called me on the phone. I'm like, oh, great. And this was the new medical director that almost fired me, or that actually saved me from getting fired. So we got him now, correct? Yeah, yeah. He saved me from getting fired the first time, which I didn't even know about. They were firing me when he first came to work. I was not one. I don't know. I might have forgot about it. So he goes, he said, hey, I had a conversation with the pediatric uh, hospitalist. I'm like, yeah, you want to tell me your side? I'm like, yeah, it's horrible. Uh, he said, I said, are we good? He said, Oh yeah, she said, he said you questioned uh, questioned her her decision. He said I told her that's your job. Question her decision. I was like, okay, well, thanks. It's like because I just looked it out for the best interest of the patient. He said, he said she doesn't know the intricacies of what y'all do. So I said I don't doubt that you were very civil and calm. I was like, I was getting yelled at. I said, so. The ER doctors are looking at me like, what the hell is going on in my ER? They just want to be yelling at you. And I think that's one of the main differences between um, the nylon and, trans and, and transport is that you have to be a little bit more judicious because you have a lot more interaction between uh, <coughs> the staff and yourself. Absolutely. And 911 is like, here, here's your patient back. Yep. You know, you have to talk to you, have to be a little bit more fuzzy. I'm on one, it is your baby, no matter what it is. Yeah, well, it's, but it's, you know, you, 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 know, you come in, you, you bring your patient, you leave. You, you don't have to, uh, you know, start your drugs, your bed settings, right? You spend a lot more time at the bedside than when you're 911 or your patient, you know, go and get a call. I, I you know, that, they talk to the doctor and find out what your waters are and all this crap. And yeah, so yeah, you got to be able, just a little bit more politicking. <laughs> a little, little, little bit nicer, but sometimes that doesn't come across that way. It's a lot, lot, lot more yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. <laughs> what happened here? Everything stopped working. <laughs> Um, okay, typical rail transport trucks, everything varies very in quality, just like a typical Dodge. It's over here with the, with the hood up, it's not running. Yeah. <laughs> um, fixed wing, it's beautiful, beautiful aircraft. Um, this aircraft has actually been replaced. So, this is uh, I actually going to upload a new picture of their newest bird. It is absolutely, absolutely gorgeous. Anybody was at EM today last year, um, it was. I was at the 10th floor of the, uh, the Sheridan, and I'm sitting there watching 
at like seven o'clock at night, I'm like watching a helicopter come down past my window, landing, and I'm like, huh. Oh, that we're rolling in the building. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like, but it's a, it's, it's a gorgeous helicopter. Who's the bottom line? Uh, that's Mission in, in Asheville. Oh, that's that probably a big one. I was going to say, that's probably why I don't recognize it. Yeah. So we'll fly. <laughs> that's a that's big one. one. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, fixed wing um, aircraft. You have uh, various models, various uh, various setups, depending on where you're, where you're going. Um, four common configurations are in. Paramedic, uh, RN, RN, paramedic, paramedic, RN, RT, uh, may or may not include a third member as a driver of ground operations. Uh, Wake Forest um, Baptist now, their critical care transport is uh, their driver is not an EMT. Their driver is a security guard. Driver, uh, state of North Carolina says you have to have two certified people on that truck. They do. If you've got three, that third guy can be. Yeah. Because, you know, they, cause they, they can pay the security guard even less. That's country. Um, they're paying an emergency driver and all that. You know, they do what they're supposed to do, but I'm like, oh, you have, like, a security guard. Okay, cool. Whatever. Whatever fun you've got. Um, just different ways that organizations look to modify their resources. Um, you don't have enough people, and I don't know if that's a routine thing or not, but I've run into it three times with them, so I would think that's pretty routine. Pretty routine. <laughs> um, some specialized transports classified, again, we talked about pediatric neonatal, um, maternal burns. Where's my clicker? Not working. Uh, working now, isn't it? So the RN paramedic configuration is generally considered the most common. Uh, you have different perspectives, different views, different training, um, ideally equal responsibilities, uh, depending on where you are. Legislation and nursing body, uh, nursing bodies, organizations do absolutely affect this. Uh, RN and RT more common on you know, specialty teams between uh, interfacility um, hospital-based programs, neonatal um, specialty transports. I will say, um, so it's a unique animal because as a uh, as an RN and a paramedic, most uh, um, in a unique instance, you know, a unique situation. Most RNs can't say that, oh, if something happened, I can innovate that patient, right? Um, I have to jump through hoops to be able to continue to do that just within my hospital because that's the way it works. Um, but I continually do that so that I have that that flexible ability I have that that uh, skill set that I can add and keep and uh, I enjoy it so why, why not right um, it's a little more pain but you know so we have those those little flexion you know there's things along in the were um, state rephrase this depending on the protocols and what's authorized in, in certain states who can hang who can actually initiate blood versus who can monitor blood that's a paramedic can monitor blood but they can't actually start it yeah, you know, many which is say, you know this was running when i left here. yeah so which is <laughs> dumb right i i to, to some extent know, to some extent their own defense there's a lot of stuff that goes on with starting there, there is, and there's a, and we're not very good at providing education on it. Yes. Um, so there's a reason that they say it's not in the it's not in the, in the skill set because we don't train people on it, yeah. and there's the small risk of recognizing a reaction, and there's a lot of type of reactions that, that can happen. Yes. We don't necessarily provide a whole lot of education to paramedics on what kind of reactions happen with blood transfusions. Yeah. Um, we Talk about, you know, okay, you have an allergic reaction, an anaphylactic reaction, and we know how to deal with that. That's pretty much where we stop. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's a whole lot of animal, you right, there's a whole lot of reasons behind that. Um, certification is continually in a state of flux in um, a number of different jurisdictions. So uh, the certified flight paramedic certification is offered by the Board of Critical Care. Actually, that's the internet. International Board of Specialty Care Transport 
um, service, the IBSC, they changed their name last year. Um, same thing, CCPC, and uh, again, it's not a, uh, it's, it is a certification, it's not a licensure by any means. Uh, University of Iowa's critical care paramedic it is recognized in over 30 states, um, not as common in the eastern United States. Uh, course completion certificates and in-service requirements, um, and they will talk about those too. Uh, UMBC is the most widely used on the uh, um, eastern coast because that's uh, the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, it is not accepted in most of the western states. Uh, course completion uh, is not a certification in, in this instance. The some of the other states uh, that actually have specialty care transport, uh, critical care transport certifications, and North County used to have um, a couple certifications specialized for um, critical care. It didn't necessarily it didn't apply to the paramedics. It was like a, we used to have a mobile intensive care nurse certification with OEMS. We don't have that anymore. Um, and because, I don't know, a couple reasons, but one getting OEMS out of the regulation of nursing um, is probably a huge thing of the nursing board. <laughs> they don't like people in their wheelhouse. But uh, so that's certification is a little bit uh, in variation among different places. A few states have their state critical care certification. The University of Iowa is the only course accepted in Iowa. Um, Tennessee does require um, a the passage of the state test. We, um, so I was in Tennessee, worked for Rural Metro, actually had to have a, a critical, it's not a critical care, it's called a specialty care um, certification in Tennessee. So North, North Carolina does accept either curriculum as education standard for providing critical care education. I'm gonna get through scope of practice and then I'm gonna stop because I'm talking a total. 40, 40 minutes and we're cutting off even though it's a little late starting. Scope of practice may or may not include advanced uh, techniques of RSI, surgical airways in North Carolina. RSI is a, uh, uh, one of those things that critical care, um, specialty care truck has to have. You have to be able to do it. Doesn't mean you do do it, it just means you have to have it. Um, ventilator management, pulse oximetry, capnography, chest tube placement and monitoring. It means you have to be able to do it. it. Doesn't mean you do do it. It means you have to be able to do it. Um, thoracic gastroenterologies, uh, transvenous pacing. Um, this is probably very, very few services that will do um outside of flight or specialty um, services. <coughs> transvenous pacing. That's super dependent. Um, even our even a lot of critical care services. Um, it's really dependent on whether they're going to be doing doing transvenous pace. Um, I'm sorry. They will do tra they'll transport transvenous pace. I'm thinking of placing transvenous pacers. That's a whole other argument for later. Uh, <laughs> and a whole other discussion. Intraoretic balloon pumps, uh, very common, but we're going to see less, um, less reliance on it. I'll talk about that one day um, about why. 12 lead. Uh, um, EKG, central venous catheter management, placement, interpretation, ICP monitoring, uh, venous cut down, uh, blood, so blood initiation, blood product administration, monitoring, infusion pumps, advanced uh, pharmalo pharmacological intervention. A lot of this stuff carries over to what we do already every day. Some of it is just different. I don't normally carry milrinone on a regular hot inter hospital transport. Most paramedics probably don't know what I'm talking about when I say milrinone. Or um, if you took a paramedic from a service that's never transported a patient out of a coronary ICU and you told them what a balloon pump was, like, I've heard of it. I probably couldn't tell you if they're looking at it though. Um, I was <laughs> I meant to bring a balloon pump trainer and the balloon pump and totally blew off on uh, that when I left Friday. So that was my fault. But um, next week I'll have some material I'll be emailing out on balloon pumps too. So 
So lots of uh, variability. There are no state uh, or there are no federal minimum standards for um, scope of practice. There are very few statewide standards. <coughs> I said North Carolina has a standard for a critical care truck. It has to be equipped with this X number of material and it has to be equipped with these skills. That doesn't mean you actually have to do those skills because your medical director can say, yeah, we have RSI, but you're never going to do it in my truck. That's. Um, or you have to you know, meet this criteria. You know, we have, you have to meet this stuff, criteria. You, you have know, to be trained, you know, but you're never going to do it. will occur before yeah. you get on. So yeah, that, absolutely. And, and so there, there's, there are dynamics related to that. Well, damn politics is a, a huge one there. Um, APP, Advanced Practic, practic uh, Paramedics, has dropped from a national scope due to pressure from uh, the uh, fire service and affiliated lobbies. It's, we do see more um, support, and you're seeing this kind of broaden a little bit, but the funding has just never really um, taken off. There's a new initiative, and I know Wake County has been a huge proponent of Advanced Practice Paramedics, but still getting the funding out of that actually I mean, funding the county's funding, but getting paid for it is the problem still. What is it? What do you mean? An advanced practice paramedic? So um, these are very similar to what we talk about community, um, these community paramedics. They're so opposite. So they're a version of this, but. Um, yeah, they're doing, uh, they're going out, and, and our objective for a. Um, a APP project was to reduce readmissions for CHF patients. So, you got we basically took the big whack at the target, the largest group of readmissions, and said, "Hey, what are we going to do? This is a way we can have people go to the, go into these populations to try to identify problems before they ever become problems to help." Um, one problem is the EMS system ate the burden of the cost. Yeah, it saves a hospitals money, but Unless your hospital's in bed with EMS, it doesn't do any good, <laughs> you know, that to for the for the service itself. So, um, you know, EMT um, has said this level, level would not require a unique licensure. Said it'd be a specialty certification earned through continued education, advanced. Uh, uh, Advanced competencies, clinical requirements may require paramedic experience and support endorsements as part of the certification process. So it's really um, dependent on location, uh, protocol driven. And these, when you talk about other things, these uh, folks will do, they'll do uh, vaccinations, they'll do you know, things in the community. Um, really, really fun driven on prevention and uh, improvement of quality, quality of life for patients before we ever see them. All right, let's take 10 minutes and I'm gonna pause this.